I think there's nothing more beautiful than a voice in the dark, and especially if it's a quiet one. And one of the most distinctive and most impactful quiet voices of recent times is that of Susan Cain. Susan Cain is the author of the bestseller Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Um, that was a bestseller in 2012 when it came out, and it was on the heels of a blockbuster TED Talk that is to date one of the most popular, I think one of the most, three most popular TED Talks of all time with more than 20 million views. And Susan is also the founder of Quiet Revolution, which is a global movement to unlock the power of introverts for the benefit of all of us. Um, welcome, Susan Kane. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you so much, Tim. I have to say, as I was, um, I can't see you in the dark, but as I was getting ready to speak to you, I was thinking about how there must be a word in some language. I know we have a very global audience, so maybe somebody's got a word for it. Um, but the word for uh, a person who you really love to see and be with and who you rarely see. Um, and so that's how I feel about you, and I'm searching for that word. Um, and also to all of you here today, uh, for those of you who might follow me on social media, you know that I'm always talking about kindred spirits and my desire to be among kindred spirits and write to them and with them and everything. Um, and, and I know this is an audience and a group of kindred spirits. So thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's wonderful. Um, can we turn up the volume just a little bit? Um, thank oh. you. Uh, Would, no, no, is no. This, <laughs> is this better? Yes, <laughs> that looks good. That, yeah, I think it's it's us here in in this pen. Um, and welcome okay, back. Okay, tell, tell me if you if I should put this down or keep it. I think you can. The way it, it is, put it down. It looks great, but you can also so. put okay. it down. It's more like okay. uh, yeah, exactly uh, very radio okay. DJ ish. Yes, exactly. So you were actually here in 2018. So you were here at the House of Beautiful Business Annual Gathering, and you attended incognito. And I remember we were sitting in yeah. one of these rooms in a very different environment than this one at the Academy of Sciences with lots of tiles around and we ate cheese. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that episode made it into your upcoming book, Bittersweet. What, what memories do you have of your visit to the house in 2018? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, when, oh, am I starting to echo maybe? No, I nope. think we're okay. Um, okay. So yeah, I, I came to the house in 2018. I think I was deep in the middle of researching um, this book that's about to come out in April. It's called Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Can Make Us Whole. And um, I don't know, I just remember, I, I think I was drawn to HOBB and came because I sensed that there was something, uh, like some of the answers that I was trying to get to in that book were what you are living in a certain way um, and the vision of business and life that that, that you're propagating. And, you know, I remember, for example, you um, passing out fortune cookies. What, what did you call them? Sadness cookies, was it? it, it you, you, you did a whole session on um, how sadness was the last great taboo in business. And I was really struck by that because, you know, that was especially then before COVID. It was at a time in my life that I was attending a gazillion business conferences nonstop from one to another. And you know, never in all my time of doing that have I heard anybody talk about that topic, like never. Um, you know, and there you were as if it was the most natural thing in the world in this incredibly uh, beautiful setting. And, and the beauty is not unrelated to the uh, melancholy of which you were speaking. And we can talk about that later too, if you'd like. Yeah, we'll come, we'll come back to that uh, sadness, melancholy and other um, emotions. Let's talk first about Quiet. So it's almost mm -hmm. 10 years since its release in 2012. Yeah. And it's amazing. I mean, if you Google Quiet and you Google your name to date, it's just remarkable how impactful this book has been and how much coverage it's still getting and how relevant it still yeah. is. So uh, I know you're very humble, but when you look back at the, the past 10 years, what, how would you say the book has changed the world and specifically oh, the gosh. workplace? I mean, uh... I think what's really happened is that, well, it's a few different things. I think one thing is that just the, the concept of introverts and extroverts, the word introverts and extroverts have just become part of everyday speech now. You know, they're household words in a way that they hadn't been before. Um, and what that means is that, like, you know, the reason I wrote the book is because so much of the way that we interact, um, you know, the way we live and love and make decisions 
and um, interact at work in particular. Um, so much of this has to do with our levels of introversion and extroversion. You know, one psychologist calls, calls them the north and south of human temperament. Um, and we did not before have a lens for seeing all of that. Um, for seeing those human dynamics. And I, I think we have it now, you know, I, I, I mean, I think we still have a long way to go, um, but I hear constantly, like all the time I'm hearing from companies who spontaneously are, you know, forming um, groups and, and missions within their company to, to bring this issue to the table and think about how it affects their internal workplace dynamics. So to me, that's like, that's just remarkable. So, some people are saying the, the pandemic has been a boon for introverts. Um, it was easier for introverts, or it has brought new attention to a more introverted way of life for many of us. Yeah. Um, do you agree? And, and how was your experience during the pandemic? Um, I do agree. I, I think it tends that the story is not as simple as often gets told, because um, there's actually data showing that introverts in certain ways had a harder time with the pandemic than extroverts did. Um, uh, you know, and I, I do think there's there's a kind of association between introverts and um, there's sort of a discomfort with change. It takes a while to assimilate new changes. Um, but at the same time, of course, it, uh, for many introverts, normalized what our natural preferences would have been in the first place. And I certainly have had, well, I, I've had both of those experiences, I guess. Um, you know, well, first of all, I, I mean, I lost... I lost immediate family members in the pandemic. So I'm just gonna put that aside because I think we're talking more about, uh, you know, at this moment, I think we're talking more about, um, you know, how did it affect kind of our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and I, for 15 years now, have pretty much until the pandemic spent every single day inside a cafe writing. You know, it's my happiest place to be. I love it, love it, love it. Um, so having that taken away all of a sudden was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know if I can finish writing this book. What am I going to do? Um, and I did adapt to that eventually. Um, so that was kind of like the downside. But, um, but yeah, I, I definitely did have an experience of being like, wow, I'm suddenly off the hook for a whole variety of social obligations that before this I would have had to go through the process of weighing, do I want to say yes, do I want to say no, um, you know. Which ones do I want to go to? And, and all, all of that was suddenly not there. And I realized how little I missed it. Um, and I don't think that's just me. I, I, I know many people have felt that way. So it's interesting, right? The pandemic may, maybe has made us quieter in some ways. But at the same time, there's also the rise of TikTok and social audio. And it seems like constant chatter is even more pervasive than before. Um, do you share that observation? And, and do you think there's a stronger counter movement or there's an opportunity to create more quieter spaces in response? Or has the world gotten chattier just despite your, your book? Well, I guess I would say we, we now have, as I was saying before, we have a greater awareness of these dynamics. That's the good side. I do think, <clears throat> excuse me, as you're pointing out about the rise of TikTok and things like that, when Quiet came out, um, I saw the rise of the internet from an introvert's point of view as primarily something positive because it was a way suddenly to be able to communicate with lots of people you know, without leaving your house and often um, just simply via a keyboard, which is a, a you know, like a, a unimodal way, let's say, of communicating. Um, but now with so much on video and so much about how many followers do you have and all this kind of thing, I, I, I do think that um, internet communication is becoming more and more extroverted and we need to be this is a time to be thinking dynamically about ways to make it quieter again. Um, I, I come back to this quote that I cite many times, you know, it's a, a Proust saying that reading is the miracle of a communication in the midst of solitude. Um, and I've always been struck by that quote because as soon as I read it, I was like, yes, that's, that's it, exactly. Um, so, okay, now we're not only in the world of books and reading, we're in this brave new world, but how do we get to replicate what Proust was talking about in a digital space? I don't think we figured it out yet. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a really beautiful quote. Some people often say that, that introverts are better listeners. So, um, is that true? 
Um, yes and no. I do think that listening is a skill that introverts tend to cultivate from an early age because we don't really like to have the spotlight on us. So, and by the way, I'm saying we in this, you know, broad brush way. And I, I do think it's worth, before I even answer this question, it's, it's worth saying, you know, these are like general broad brush categories, but it's not like everything I'm saying is going to apply to every introvert and not to every extrovert. You know, we're all much more gloriously complicated than that. And I, I think it's worth saying that as we talk about all this. Um, but having said that, yeah, I do think that many introverts um, cultivate this skill of listening kind of as, as a way of deflecting the attention away from ourselves. And that's a separate, and, and so it's a great skill to have. Um, I do think it's a separate thing from the empathy and the curiosity that makes people truly good listeners. So I think if you're like, um, you know, a curious and empathetic introvert who has also cultivated that skill all your life, you're going to be a listener extraordinaire. Um, but yeah, but I, but I do think at the underneath it is really um, it's curiosity and empathy that are the real drivers. There's so much talk about listening now uh, at the workplace and in organizations and uh, companies have instituted chief listening officers and yeah. one has to listen to their customer and listen to the employees. But listening is expensive, isn't it, in the business context? I mean, you need to be able to afford listening. Um, so I kind of wonder how power structures play into this. So I guess usually the ones who can afford to listen and to be quote unquote unproductive by listening or not produce anything immediately are probably higher up in the food chain, but it's much harder for people who are more junior or at the beginning of their, their career because they have to prove that they're productive and maybe they don't have the privilege of, of listening. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I, I see listening as a superpower no matter where in this world you find yourself situated. Um, you know, because no matter what, you're going to be learning so much that you didn't know. You know, every moment that you're talking is a moment that you're saying something you already knew. <laughs> every moment that you're listening is a, a chance to learn something new. And I, I, I don't know any situation in life where that's not super valuable. Um, I would also say for people listening who are introverts, regardless of whether you're a senior, junior, whatever, um, you know, I, I, I have interviewed many senior introverted leaders in organizations who tell me that they always understood that they weren't, they, they weren't going to advance in their careers by being you know, the most dominant or charismatic person in the room. Um, but, but very often their way of advancement or, or their, their way of standing out, let's say, they, they were people who made one-on-one -on -one connections in very deep ways, kind of one person at a time, you know, one by one by one by one, they would go and make these connections. Um, and it was through that that they started wielding a kind of quiet power of their own. And I don't know that you can make those kinds of connections without listening. Yeah, and when you listen, you also are able to detect I guess the undertones and more ambiguous notes, and that brings us to uh, Bitter Sweet, your upcoming yeah. book, which is slated for release in April 2022. And you've been working on this for yeah. many years now, right? Like since 2017 or 16? Yeah, I think it's 2017. Yeah, five years. Yeah. yeah. And the subtitle is, uh, as you pointed out earlier, how sorrow and longing can make us whole. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of, that, that's the actual subtitle. I keep thinking, make us whole again, but the actual subtitle mm -hmm. is without again. Um, and a bittersweet business, one could argue, is, is a beautiful business, right? It allows for uh, more ambiguity, more, more shades of color. Um, but it's really hard because in business, for the most part, at least sort of the way I experience it, we still live in this culture of forced positivity, right? We're yes. expected to be happy, and productive and joyful, but negative emotions are still somewhat taboo. And even when Brené Brown and others talk about vulnerability, there is a real risk, right, that that's becoming commodified or becoming sort of mere lip service. So, so what do we? So first of all, what is the value of sorrow and longing and negative emotions? Why should we give them more space? I, I mean, well, one reason to give them more space is just for the humanity of it. That, that is what it means to live in this world. I mean, this world is a mix of joy and sorrow. That's what it is. That's what it has always been. That's what it will always be. 
Um, so to say that you're going to go to a workplace for however many hours a day and pretend that that's not so is, is just like that's just a little crazy making. But um, but besides that, I, you know, in in the book, I, I trace the connection between this state of being and this recognition um, with three. I'll call them superpowers. One is creativity, one is connection, and one is transcendence. Um, and all of these are are intense interest um, from a business point of view. And I, I, I could I don't know how much time we have. I could tell you um, I could give you some examples of ways in which this has played out in specific companies too. Yeah, we have time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> give us some examples, um, especially the transcendence part. I find really interesting. What what? How do you how do you implement transcendence into an organization? Well, I think that's the one that actually has to follow from the others, but um, because it has to follow from the creativity, really. Um, okay, let me just take a big step back before we get to these examples. I, and you know, and this is the perfect place to talk about it because um, all of you are, are dedicated to the importance of, of beauty, really, as a central focal point of business. Um, so, I'm trying to figure out how far back to go. Um, I Okay, I started researching this book because, I may have said this to you, Tim, when we met each other last time, I can't remember. Um, all my life, I have had this experience upon listening to bittersweet music, um, you know, minor key music. I've had this experience that was not really sad at all. It was more an experience of um, love, um, and a kind of piercing joy at the beauty of the world, and um, like a sense that it was okay that we're all mortal, and you know that wouldn't necessarily last for that long each time I listen to the music, but it but it stays with you. Um, and I couldn't figure out why it would be that this kind of music would would elicit that reaction. Um, but then I started looking into it and realizing that many people have this reaction to sad music. Um, people listen to the sad songs on their playlists uh, 800 times compared to the 185 times that they listen to the happy music. Um, and when you, really, when you really look at what that is, it's a kind of, um, there's something about sad music and there's all kinds of evolutionary reasons for it, but there's something about Sadness, sorrow, the, the bitter side of, of bittersweet that draws us together. Um, and it actually, it, and it has a kind of spiritual component to it, regardless of whether you think of yourself as an atheist or a believer or somewhere in between. Um, when you start following this trail, and, and, and so artists and philosophers have been actually looking at this question of bittersweetness for, for thousands of years. We just sort of don't name it really, but but it's all over the place. When you follow this trail, what you see is that when you behold something that's beautiful, um, and you know that experience when you see something beautiful, like you're on a vacation, you see a mountain, whatever, and you have this experience where you want to merge with it, like, like it's so great, you want to do something with it. Um, what, you're, what it's really eliciting in you is, is kind of the spiritual sense. Um, it's, it's this sense that, that the novelist Mark Merlis calls um, a kind of longing for the shore from which we were deported before we were born. Um, you know, it's this sense in us that somewhere out there is this more perfect and beautiful world um, that we've lost and we, we would love to be back there again. And every time you see something beautiful, that is what is stimulated in you. So it's, it, it's like, it's your deepest, greatest self, really. Um, and, and I think for those of us who don't practice a religion in any kind of formal way, we've lost touch with, with what those spiritual impulses actually are, but they're alive in every single one of us. Um, and so I guess that's the answer to transcendence. And that's why, that's why beauty and a kind of particularly bittersweet type of beauty is so important. You know, like Baudelaire said that he, he couldn't imagine um, any kind of beauty that didn't have melancholy within it. What can companies do? to create more space for that kind of um, bittersweetness? Well, I think it really starts with the culture. Um, so I'll give you an example or two examples. Like, so this one company that I looked at, it was called Midwest Billing. And um, uh, this was an organization where 
It was basically a bunch of bill collectors for a hospital. So it was like the dreariest job that you could possibly imagine. You know, you basically had to get on the phone and ask people for the money that maybe they couldn't even afford to give. Um, and and the, the turnover in this industry is notoriously high for obvious reasons. But at this particular unit, they had somehow established a culture where it, it really had become normalized to, um, to talk about what your sorrows and longings and, um, and issues were as a part of day-to-day -day experience. Um, and then for everybody to come and kind of rally with you if you wanted that. Um, and, 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 and people would, well, this was all documented by a business school study. Um, you know, pe people would do this for all different kinds of sorrows, whether it was the, the death of someone's mother or a breakup or an illness or whatever, it didn't really matter. Um, and, 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 and they did all these interviews with the people who worked there and they all talked about what a transformative experience it was. And this was not just a qualitative thing because after they tracked it for a while, they saw that, um, that the turnover in this, in this organization was much lower than in any of its competitors. Um, and they also were able to increase their rate of bill collecting by, by, by a really significant percentage. Um, and it was attributed to this culture that made people come and want to do this. Um, and, you know, just in case you're sitting there and privately thinking, well, you know, maybe this worked for a more gentler work environment, but, you know, it could never work in my space. Um, I also looked at another organization, which was an oil rig uh, on the Gulf of Mexico, uh, led by a guy named Rick Fox. And this oil rig had a really stereotypically macho culture, you know, where you would never, ever talk about sorrows and longings and vulnerabilities. Like you just were not going to go there. You weren't even going to admit if you didn't know how to do something, um, you know, something technical. But, um, but what happened is this guy, Rick Fox, who, who people saw as a really uh, dedicated leader, he, he was suddenly tasked with moving this oil rig to a much bigger space and to doubling the size of his workforce. And he says now he was flat out terrified by having to do this. Like he didn't know if he could keep people safe um, by the enorm with the enormity of this change and this task. And, and so he did this really unorthodox thing of, um, of working with a company. <laughs> he like brought all his people in with him at this company and they sat there for like nine days at a time all from, from morning till night. And they talked about all their deepest concerns and their family patterns and um, you know all, all the things that you're not really supposed to talk about at work, but they somehow did it. And he felt not only did he, was he able to be a more whole leader because he, he realized that he had been invested in the image of being the invulnerable leader and that made everybody else feel like they had to show up that way too. Um, but once, once he made that shift, other people did too. And, and this too was studied by um, a Harvard Business School case study and their safety rankings as a result were off the charts and so was their productivity. So, um, so it can be done. I think we're only at the beginning of it. I think that you, uh, you were on the forefront of it by introducing this topic all the way back in 2018, but I predict over the next 10 years, it's been going to become much more commonplace. Susan, we're indeed running out of time and I also wanna be mindful <laughs> of your time. Uh, one last question for you before we, sure. we, we wrap. Um, what, is, what is something that you long for right now? Right now, uh, gosh. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I guess I still long for the return of my cafe life, let's say, um, you know, just in the, in the kind of everyday sense of longing. But, um, but what I'm, I don't know, I guess what I'm much more interested in and what really drives me is the, the um, more profound sense of longing that I think gets ignited when you confront something beautiful. Um, and, and that's what really opens us up. It's a beautiful line in, in, in the movie Central Station. I think it's the last line where the protagonist says, I have a longing for everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, actually, Duff was talking about a poem by Rumi um, that he couldn't recall, so I think he didn't say it in the end. And um, do we have time for me to yes. just tell you about this Please. one? Yeah. Yeah, so, so Rumi talks about this, like about 
the power of longing and what it does in you. And, um, and this is in the context, I was saying that all of this has to do regardless of whether you're um, an atheist or a believer somewhere in between. So this is this poem, Love Dogs, where um, it, it's about a man who's praying until a cynic comes along and asks him, you know, what are you praying for? Did you ever get an answer? You should stop. And the man does stop. Um, and, then, and then that night he falls asleep and he sleeps very fitfully, he can't sleep. And he, he's visited by uh, Hitter, who is the, the god of souls, I think it is, or the, the guide of souls. Um, and Hitter says to him um, that this, this is what he says, this longing for God, this longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. And so that's why I say I don't know that we really can or should extinguish our most fundamental longing because I think that is ultimately the connection. Susan, thank you so much for joining us virtually. It's for, it was almost like as if you were here. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.